Hello, everyone. I'm Yusuke Matsushita from the University of Tokyo. And I'm Xavier Denis from the University of Paris-Saclay. Um, today, we are going to talk about our work, Rust Home Build, which is joint work with Jacques-Henri Judon and Derek Dreyer. So you, you may be feeling that, uh, yeah, this is the fourth talk uh, using Iris, so you may feel that help me. I, I don't know much about Iris, actually. Uh, but uh, don't worry. You, uh, this talk is uh, more about Rust and than Iris. And you may also wonder that, uh, worry that uh, I don't know much about Rust, then I'll explain, okay. So, um, so roughly speaking, our high-level goal is to give a foundation for verifying realistic Rust programs. So what do I mean by that? So Rust is a safe systems programming language where a program is mostly written in safe code. It is by construction safe or memory and thread safe um, thanks to ownership types, um, yeah, which enforces a principle called aliasing XOR mutability. That is, every object in Rust cannot be aliased and mutable at the same time. But real Rust programs also use various Rust APIs, such as VEC and MUTEX. Each of these APIs encapsulate uh, internal implementation, which is risked by Rust experts uh, in unsafe code where low-level operations are unrestricted, just like C or C++. So we want to give a foundation for verifying Rust programs with this combination of safe code and unsafe code. More concretely, our work is built on two major lines of prior work on Rust verification. One line of work is Rust build, Jung et al. Um, it is the first formal mechanized proof of type safety or memory and thread safety for Rust type system. It provides a semantic model of Rust ownership types in the separation logic iris, and using, using that manually proves that Rust APIs built from unsafe code with a bunch of low-level operations are semantically safe. The other line of work is automated functional verifiers for Rust, including Rust Home by Matushita et al. and Proust by Astrox et al. These tools can automatically, without much manual effort, verify functional correctness of Rust programs, not only safety. <coughs> On the other hand, they only target safe code, no unsafe code. The goal of our work, Rust Home Build, is to marry Rust Build with Rust Home from these two lines. To see what this means, let's go back to our picture of a real Rust program. So first, our predecessor, Rust Build, is a foundation for verifying type safety of Rust type system. For that, it verifies unsafe code implementation of each API manually in the separation logic iris. On the other hand, Rust Home can automatically verify functional correctness of a Rust program within in safe code. So our work, Rust Home Build, puts these two things together. It is a foundation for verifying functional correctness, not just type safety, of Rust programs with APIs implemented by unsafe code. Those APIs verified by Rust Home Build can be soundly linked with other safe Rust code, which are in turn automatically verified by Rust Home. In short, Rust Home Build does for Rust Home what the Rust Build did for Rust type system, extending it to account for unsafe code. So in summary, our work Rust Home Build is a marriage of Rust Build with Rust Home. It provides a Rust Build based semantic model of Rust ownership types and separation logic iris, fully mechanized in Coq. But the model is extended with Rust Home style functional specifications for functional correctness. Using that, we proved soundness of Rust Home style specs of various key Rust APIs like Vegan um, Mutex with implementation and unsafe code. For that, <coughs> for that uh, we use the type spec system and the framework of parametric processes, which are explained towards the end of the talk. So, you have some picture of uh, Rust Home Build, but um, before uh, explaining technical size of Rust Home Build, I'd like to answer a question uh, most of you may want to ask. Um, hey, what the heck is Rust Home, more concretely? Okay, consider, uh, consider the following Rust function, max or inco, as a motivating example. Roughly speaking, this function inputs two integer pointers and outputs the one with the larger target value. And after incrementing the other one uh, by uh, 42. But it also uses a notable feature of Rust, mutable references. 
The inputs MA and MB are mutable references, respectively, which means that they temporarily borrow ownership to the object it, they point to. And thanks to ownership, each mutable reference is not alias, which gives the key precondition to this function. Okay, so now a question for the audience. Do you have any idea of the spec of this function? Probably no. <laughs> and, or uh, more simply, in particular, what kind of logic do you want to use? Operation logic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> so, um, I heard someone said separation logic. <laughs> uh, I don't know nobody. I don't know nobody, but uh, yeah. But yeah, that could be an answer. Uh, separation logic, which does modular reasoning using ownership, is a natural choice for verifying low level code. But actually, no, that's not what we are going to do here. Rust ownership type system already builds in a kind of separation logic. So once the program is type checked by Rust, in the verification phase, we want to avoid using separation logic anymore. But how? Rust home solves this puzzle. It automates functional verification of safe Rust code only using reasoning and first order logic, no separation logic. Because everything's in first order logic, we can take advantage of existing automation techniques for verifying functional programs. For example, Rust home uses constrained home closes, and its offspring verifier, Cruzo by Denis et al., uses Y3, a verification platform for an ML like language. To do everything in first order logic, the key challenge is how to tackle mutable references. And yeah, Rust home solves the puzzle elegantly. It represents a mutable reference MA as a pair of values, A, A prime. No address or no memory state, just values. The first component of the pair, A, is simply the current value of the pointer's target, which is stably known thanks to ownership. But what's the second component, A prime? So this is the key machinery of Rust Home. It's a proxy divining future information, that is, what will be the final value of the pointer's target when the borrowed ownership is returned to the original owner. So this representation of a mutable reference, tricky but elegant, gets the most out of uh, the guarantees by Rust's ownership type system. So here's the spec Rust Home gives to the function max or enco. As you can see, a mutable reference, MA or MB, is represented as a pair of the current value and the proxy of the final value, like A, A prime, or B, B prime. And when a mutable reference is thrown away, or it, we, when we lose the ownership of it, we resolve its proxy to the target value at that point, observing an equality like B prime equals B plus 42. This is a key trick for communicating the result of mutation by uh, made by mutable reference to the original owner. Okay, so now you've got a picture of Rust Home. Let's move on to technical details of our work, Rust Home Build. Thank you. So in Rust Home Build, our objective is to formalize the kind of prophetic reasoning we're doing in Rust Home and to do it in a way that allows us to account for the presence of unsafe code. We do this by constructing what we call a type spec system. So we work from the type system of Rust Belt, which takes an input type context T, some instruction I, which produces a result R in a type context T prime. And we add to it a specification. These specifications are written as predicate transformers. So we take a predicate over the output type context T prime and transform it into a predicate over the input type context T. You may notice here that we're actually talking about floor of T and floor of T prime. That's because these are actually the semantic values of the type context. This is what we call the rust horn style representation of an object. For example, for integers, we'll, for machine integers, we'll use mathematical integers. For rust pairs, we'll use mathematical pairs. And as we just saw, for mutable borrows, we'll use a pair of a current value and a prophecy. Um, and then we can ask ourselves, how do we actually give semantics to these? And how do we actually give a semantics that will allow us to prove the soundness of rust horn style reasoning? Once again, we start from prior work. We take, if we take a look at how Rust Belt actually defines the semantics of their type judgments, they do this by using the separation logic iris and viewing judgments as whore triples. Effectively, what they're saying is that the input type context is well typed and separated in the memory of the, of the machine, and that the instruction i produces a new well typed and separated context t prime in the output memory. 
And once again, we add everything needed for our specifications. So we have a specification phi for the instruction i here, and we have to quantify over the post conditions of the instruction because we don't know what could happen afterwards. And so then in the post condition of our whole triple, we want to uh, guarantee that, phi, that the post condition holds. For this, as we saw, the post conditions are predicates over the output type context, and they're predicates over those semantic values. So we introduce those values b bar here by using an existential quantifier and link it to both the post condition and the type context. And then we can use phi to transform this post condition into the precondition that we need to actually able, uh, be able to call i correctly. This gives a slight idea of uh, our semantics, but we'll see in just a second how this fails to account for things like mutual borrows and what we need to do to uh, extend these uh, semantics to handle that. To do this, we'll motivate it with a simple type, vec, the type of global heap allocated arrays. This type is implemented using unsafe code. Notably, vecs are actually just a pointer to some slab of memory. and They do operations on that slab, like uh, allocating a new slab, adding elements to it, indexing to it. And so in particular, we'll look at two functions. The first is push. We take a mutable borrow to some vector and an element. And then we add that to the right-hand side of the vector. And the second is perhaps the quintessential vec function, index mute. We take a mutable borrow to our vector, an index into that vector, and we return a mutable borrow to the ith element of our vector. But before we can go further, once again, we need to talk about these Rust horn style representations. So we need to give vector representation. And in this case, we'll just represent vectors as mathematical lists of items in the vector. So how do we actually give a Rust horn style, a Rust horn built style specification to something like push? Well, we can start off by looking at the typing information that we need for push, right? So we have this mutable borrow to a vector, and we have the element that we'd like to add to it. Note, though, that we don't actually produce anything on the right-hand side, and that's because push doesn't actually give us a result back. It's performing a side effect, right? So it's doing stuff in the memory dynamically. This poses uh, a little bit of a challenge for the specification. And so we can ask ourselves, what is actually the behavior that we want to give push, right? After a call to push, what do we want to be able to say? In particular, we'd like to say that the vector that is pointed to by MV has now been updated to contain A at its very end. And we do this in this way. So what we're actually saying here is that we're going to take a look at the prophecy of MV, right? the final value that MV is going to have. And we're going to resolve it to the value it had at entry, V, with A appended to the very end. This does exactly what we would expect from push. Now let's take a look at a slightly more interesting example, index mute. Here, not only do we have a mutable borrow on the left-hand side of our typing judgment, we actually have one on the right-hand side. We're producing a mutable borrow to the ith element. This is going to make things slightly more tricky to specify. So if we try to write our specification, right off the bat, we know that we need to require the index that we're looking up to be within the bounds of our vector. So we ask it to be between 0 and the length of our vector. So far, so good. Then we get to the question of, what do we actually want to say about the value being stored in MV? Once again, we'd like to do some sort of resolution. We'd like to have some equality saying, well, the prophecy of the vector is equal to something. But the issue we have here is, what do we say about the case of i? What is the value that v prime is going to have at index i? We can't actually know this right now, because after the call to index mute, we're returning a borrow. We're returning a borrow to the ith element, which may do a bunch of updates on it. And so this is why Rusthorn uses prophecies. And that's what we want to do here once again. So what we want to do is we want to say, we're going to introduce some prophecy here. And we're going to use that prophecy as the ith index of v prime. And we can then return it as the prophecy associated to ma. Reasoning about these kinds of prophecies is really the crux of the Rust Horn Belt proof. We need some mechanism to actually be able to reason about prophetic choices in Iris directly. And, to do th and looking at prior work, we realized that uh, it wasn't flexible enough, especially to handle cases like index mute, where we're uh, creating these prophecies out of smaller bits of uh, existing structures. So instead, we developed what we call parametric prophecies, which leverages what we, uh, what we named a clairvoyant monad, effectively a reader over one possible future that can occur. And then we are able to quantify all of our predicates over all possible futures that can occur from any given point. To give a very short idea of what this actually means, if we look at our prior semantics for our typing judgments, we can complete them in this way, adding a bunch of golden prophetic information. And in particular, you may see this lambda pi thing, which is representing uh, a closure over, over all possible futures. And so it's saying that this pro uh, this, these pr uh, predicates actually have to hold for all possible futures that can occur from this point on. 
if this has made you curious about our work and you have some uh, an itch to, to learn more technical details and see more Greek symbols, we encourage you to read our paper. In the paper, we go through some of the actual proofs for, uh, for rules such as mutable borrows. And we also detail uh, quite, a fit, uh, quite a bit more of our examples like uh, mutable iterators, mutexes, cells, et cetera. Uh, and if you have any further questions, we'd be happy to answer them now. Thank you. So uh, the prophecy idea is very interesting, but I felt like I didn't quite understand what happens when you have a, a sequence of updates to one variable. Like, do you, I assume you don't mutate the prophecy variable because that would kind of, yeah, eliminate the point of it. How does that work? Uh, I, yeah, yeah. So, um, so a good so question. So, in that case, uh, so, so that's the reason why we also have a current value of mutate. So you mean mutable reference? So, so that's the reason why we also have a current value of mutable reference. So, when, so, so every time we do a mutation to a mutable reference, we update the current value. That's all. And and so only at the end of the like mu mutation, or only when we throw away the mutable reference, we do resol uh, resolution of the proxy. Uh, do I make sense? Then you're mutating the original variable, so I, I guess I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're trying to eliminate mutation, doesn't that uh, then you're still mutating? Or am I missing something? The the real challenge is that we want to eliminate the need to model a heap, right? And that typically occurs as soon as we have mutable pointers. But in the case of the mutable borrows of Rust, as long as the mutable borrows around, it's the only one that can actually modify the value it's pointing to, right? So all we care about is locally updating it within the mutable borrow. And when the borrow falls out of scope, when it's being released, then we need to somehow synchronize it with the person that lent us the ownership in the first place. So that's the purpose of the prophecy, is to do that final bridge at the moment the borrow ends. While the borrow is alive, we can totally locally mutate it. We have it on hand. So that's totally fine. OK, that makes a lot of sense. I see. So the prophecy is to eliminate the need to model the heat. Exactly. That makes sense. Thanks. Do your, um, does your Claire monad, does it subsume um, Ralph's prior um, prophecies? And do you also redo all the erasure theorems and all that? So actually, that that's a real question, and we we actually don't know the real uh, real answer. So I think we do have uh, like we can apply the, our Claire Boyer and Moya or parametric proxies to the example uh, tackled by uh, uh, Ralph uh, or uh, the future of our uh, proxies. But uh, yeah, we have to see. And if I can just add one last bit, uh, the future is ours also requires ghost instructions in your actual program to deal with the prophecies. Uh, this approach does not. It's purely ghost. It's purely logical reasoning. Right. So if I, if I may add to that, I think what we would have to do for to do the logic dynamic specifications is to actually move those specifications into the monad. Right. So it would change the specification. Yeah. Whereas the what the prophecy variables we had in the future as ours paper do is that you cannot see anything funky or prophetic going on in the spec. The spec looks like every other logically atomic spec. Prophecy is completely hidden in the implementation. Um, on the other hand, we need an erasure theorem. This approach doesn't. Yeah. Well, then I think uh, let's thank the thank speakers again. And Thank you.